In this video lecture, the first in a series of videos on the 2014 film Unfriended and New Media Theory, we're going to ask a few questions. First, what's the relationship between technologies like telephones, telegraphs, and trains, and the development of cross-cutting in the history of cinema? Second, how can we think about the development of cinematic language as something that's always influenced by the ordinary media that we use every day? And third, how might the film Unfriended be seen as part of this lineage of integrating ordinary communications technology into techniques of cinematic storytelling? So how do I want to break this down? I want to break it down in three parts. I want to think about new media and Unfriended. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the question of technology and cinematic innovation. The second thing is I want to look, about, look at the aesthetics of Unfriended within the history of film um, and to maybe uncover some aesthetic lineages that might not be apparent um, when you think about the film at first. And the third thing I want to do is uh, think about media phenomenology and um, unfriended. When I say media phenomenology, I simply am referring to the mode of discourse that's occupied by our two articles. Um, well, I'll only be talking about the Netta Alexander. The idea of um, thinking about the media we use in a phenomenological lens, that is reflecting upon the ways in which the ordinariness of experience is kind of backgrounded in our experience of media. And phenomenology is a method of bringing that ordinariness to the foreground. So we can think about the um, uh, often forgotten, overlooked uh, ways in which our lives and our sense of ourselves are transformed by the media we use every day. Um, so let's first talk about technology and cinematic innovation. What I mean by that is what is the relationship between ordinary technology, things like phones, uh, typewriters, computers, um, etc., and uh, the innovation of cinema as a medium of storytelling. So the first thing you might think of when you uh, broach this topic is the relationship between uh, big moments in um, narrative innovation uh, in cinema, say D.W. Griffith um, making films like The Lone Dale Operator in 1911, and the fact that such films, which are developing long-standing techniques of editing, are doing so, it seems, um, with the aid of incorporating ordinary technologies into, into those worlds. Um, so what does it mean that one of the first films to say, uh, do parallel editing or cross-cutting, and remember that term is the term for um, putting two disparate places um, uh, together in such a way that we feel as if they're happening simultaneously. What does it mean that we have this cinematic innovation happening around the representation of a telegraph, right? And so Tom Gunning in an essay called Heard Over the Phone will really explore this topic, and he'll say, a film like Griffith's The Lone Dale Operator, uh, shows how the new technology's ability to annihilate space and time could support and interrelate with new narrative devices such as suspenseful parallel editing. Um, why is that the case? Well, because the very idea of connecting disparate spaces um, and having them being simultaneous is something that becomes a lot easier to comprehend once we have technologies of, um, of telegraphic or, or telephonic communication, right? Think about the first time um, people got used to the idea of telegraphs and telephones. It would radically change your understanding of space, right? No longer do you have to take all the time that it would, that it would take uh, to travel from one place to another, but you can have a sense of one's existence simultaneously existing with your own through these new technologies. And the telegraph isn't the only thing that matters um, in this case. When Gunning says the new technology's ability to annihilate space and time, he's actually quoting a very famous book about trains by uh, Wolfgang Schivelbusch called The Railway Journey. Um, now the idea is this film, Lone Dale Operator, revolves around two technologies, both of which can be understood as annihilating the, the ordinary conceptions of space and time and the distances um, between them. So we have a train, which is a technology used to, say, annihilate distances. And we have a telegraph, which is also a technology used to annihilate distances. And the very technique that emerges um, or that is developed with this film that is parallel editing or cross-cutting seems to rely on the representation of these particular um, ordinary technologies, right? The same thing might go for a film like Suspense by Lois Weber. Um, she made this film in 1915, just a few years after Griffith's Lone Dale Operator. Um, she's also a very prolific um, filmmaker of the silent era um, who, who was doing a lot of narrative innovation alongside Griffith. But you might think about the contingencies of um, representing the simultaneity of disparate spaces and how 
What she does in this film is something that didn't really take off. She does a split screen, as opposed to Griffith's popularization of parallel editing, both of which are using techniques to create a privileged viewpoint that isn't allowable in theater, right? The idea that you can see two things at once. You can't flash between two disparate spaces in theater, or if you do, you have to innovate some kind of technique that makes it comprehensible to the audience. Film does it easily um, through things like this. So uh, Gunning will say, temporal simultaneity demands a more abstract sense of the interrelation of space and time. And in many instances, early filmmakers incorporated recent technology into the plots of their films to naturalize film's power to move through space and time. In other words, it's, say, it's not necessarily uh, the case that film had to develop its uh, editing techniques through things like telephones, telegraphs, and trains. But it happened to be the case um, that those technologies um, were becoming normalized at around the time that you would get narrative innovations and that they happened to be featured in these films. The telephone gunning says supplies a particularly powerful example. Um, and Griffith films also feature telephones, um, especially films like The Lonely Villa. So what are we doing when we're talking about this question? Well, in a sense, what we're doing is we're taking film theory, which is what this course has mostly been about, and we're relating it to media theory. Now, film theory is a type of uh, media theory and in plain speaking, because film is a type of medium. But what are the goals of media theory as a discipline as distinguished from, from film theory? Um, and, and what does it mean to say, uh, create an intersection between the two? Well, let's talk about that for, for one second. So I'll give you three basic uh, major texts in media theory. I'm not gonna go into them, but I just want to highlight some of the major claims um, and what's unified across these three different books from three different parts of the 20th century. Um, to think about what, what do media theorists tend to do and what do they tend to say? Well, a lot of you might be familiar with the media theorist Marshall McLuhan. He's famous for uh, the, uh, the phrase, the medium is the message. Um, he's less famous for the subtitle of his book, Understanding Media, which is a medium is any extension of our selves. Um, that's a really important and popular idea that gets rehearsed over and over throughout media theory. What does it mean to say a medium is an extension of ourselves? Well, you can think of a hammer as an extension of my arm. You can think of a radio as, a, as an extension of my voice, a camera as an extension of my eyes, right? That these devices are in some sense enhancing and transforming the way in which I, as a human being, put my messages out there in the world. Think about that word medium and how it relates to the, to the verb to mediate. That is to say, say, put something in between one thing and another as a way of facilitating the access or the communication between that one thing and another. Frederick Kittler is a German media theorist who wrote uh, his, his major work in 1986 called Gramophone Film and Typewriter. And he begins that very book with this very simple phrase, media determine our situation. Now, I'm not gonna go into uh, how he is distinguished from McLuhan because it's rather complicated, but I just want you to see that these ideas that media determine us, they shape us, they're extensions of ourselves, um, that they matter more, say, than the messages contained within medium, which is the idea of medium is the message, that these are the kind of rehearsed ideas of media theory. Um, Bernard Stiegler is a French media theorist um, and more of a, tra a classically trained philosopher, and that's the kind of media theory he's doing. He writes a series of books called Technics and Time. I'll give you one of the major arguments that he's making in this first volume, Technics and Time 1. He says the origin of the human is mutually bound up with the origin of tools, techniques, and media. That he's making a, a rather large philosophical claim. He's not just saying that media determine our situation. He's saying that media, technology, tools. These things, more than anything, determine what it means to be a human being and all of the concepts and privileged um, notions that we associate with humanness as distinct from other forms of life. Rather ambitious claim, and it takes him about four books to make this claim. Um, and it should remind us of this myth that we actually do have. And you know, this is a film studies course, you might think of one of the great uh, cinematic myths of this idea, the beginning of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is a film that is in some sense doing media theory because it's thinking about what media are, uh, what technologies are, and it begins with a rather profound claim, which is to say that the origin of human being is wrapped up with the discovery of tools. We can think about the general terrain of media theory as having to do with these grand claims um, about the importance and often the invisibility 
of media to us. Uh, when McLuhan says the medium is the message, he is in some sense saying, we forget about how distinct and world changing our media are because we're often focused on the messages contained within them, right? Uh, we might not think so much about the distinction between television and film so much as the uh, arguments um, or the contents of, um, that, that are disseminated through those distinct media. So we might say, um, to bring these two strains of thought together, that if media determine our situation, then the historically contingent media landscape um, would also determine the aesthetic possibilities of our artistic media. In other words, what does it mean to take film theory and take media theory and to put them together? Um, it means to say that if you're studying film as a medium, it would be important and useful to also study the way film changes at a, as a medium with respect to the way in which people throughout history use media differently. In other words, trains and telegraphs and telephones were the, one of the dominant and novel forms of media communication that influenced what we understand as the aesthetics of film. And today, what we might say is we have um, texting and internet use and Skype as also changing the way we understand uh, the cinematic medium. Those of you who want to see like a nice ordinary example of this kind of study, go look at uh, Tony Zhou, Every Frame of Painting. He has a great little video essay on um, how to depict texting in cinema, which is itself a kind of problem of how do we integrate the media landscape into film in a way that serves narrative purposes. Um, so that's a kind of brief introduction to the question of technology and cinematic innovation. Um, now I want to, uh, to move on to the aesthetics of Unfriended. So we're taking a little detour and just thinking about what Unfriended is doing. 